Okay, hello, I'm Nicoletta Bartonek, and on behalf of myself and Victor, the Virtual International Consortium for Truth Research, I welcome you to a new session of Truth 2021. If you don't know about it already, Victor is an online community of scholars interested in philosophical issues concerning the value and nature of truth. We welcome anyone who is interested in those issues. Our mission is to give researchers a platform for sharing their work with a virtual community of colleagues, independent of geographic location and institutional affiliation, to foster an environment of critical, constructive uh, feedback, to promote gender, racial, and ethnic inclusivity among those doing work on truth, and to support research in all areas of philosophy of truth, including but not limited to work on the nature of truth, the value of truth, ethic virtues and vices, verisimilitude and accuracy and the importance of truth to issues in social, political, and moral philosophy. Victor exists because of the generous support provided by the Future of Truth Project at the University of Connecticut, with additional support from the University of Aikido and the University of Alabama. In addition to this conference, Victor organizes online events throughout the year. We have a mailing list, a website, a Facebook group, and we are on Twitter and YouTube where you can find videos of past events. In today's session, we are closing off Truth 2021 with a discussion in celebration of the centenary of Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus entitled Truth and the Tractatus. And the plan for our session is that we will start with a talk by Hans-Johann Glock, followed by a talk by Jose Zalabardo, and we will be closing with a talk by Juliet Floyd. Each presentation will be 40 minutes, with 15, 20 minutes for the Q&A. There will be a five minute break between sessions with a time for further half an hour at the conclusion of the session for further questions, discussions and, and socializing. For the Q&A session, please use the raise hand function in Zoom if you have questions and please write Q or F in the chat in case you have follow-ups. Now, please join me in virtually welcoming Hans-Johan Glock, who is professor of philosophy and a member of the National Center for Competence in Research Evolving Language, uh, and who was awarded a Humboldt uh, Research Prize in 2015. Among his books are a Wittgenstein Dictionary, published with Blackwell in uh, 1996, uh, What is Analytic Philosophy, published with Cambridge University Press in 2008, and a companion to Wittgenstein published with Wiley in 2017 and co-edited with John Hyman. He has also published in leading international journals on topics in the philosophy of language, the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of animal minds, and the history of analytic philosophy. A collection of some of his essays on Wittgenstein is due to be published by Anthem under the title Normativity, Meaning, and Philosophy. His talk today is entitled Judgment and Truth in the Early Wittgenstein. And uh, my colleague Drew is going to share the abstract and the, and the slides with you in, in the chat. Thank you very much, Nicoletta, uh, for the introduction um, and um, the opportunity to present my ideas here in this um, context. Uh, I have to say that, you know, neither the Tractatus nor the Truth, uh, or not Truth, have been, you know, at the center of my uh, recent research. It's gone a bit stale, but I hope that uh, some of this uh, it may still be of interest. Um, certainly, the notion of truth in the Tractatus was one of my research interests, um, uh, well, 15 years ago or so. Um, so here's a preview. Um, I'll first introduce uh, the topic and my approach to it. Then I will uh, mention Russell's theories of judgment, which are essential to uh, understanding uh, both the picture theory in the Tractatus and the Tractatus account of uh, truth. Um, this is going to be sort of um, uh, child's play compared to what Jose is going to talk about, I'm sure, but you know, maybe a bit of an introduction. Then I will present the picture theory, um, uh, a more or less critical oops, account of uh, judgment uh, in the Tractatus. And then I'll focus on the topic, which is probably 
of greater interest to um, you guys, namely truth. And I'll, I'll work my way towards uh, uh, the Tractatus account of truth through looking at various ways of conceiving uh, uh, of truth as a relation of correspondence. I'll then go through uh, two um, interpretations of the Tractatus, the idea that the Tractatus is a sophisticated but standard correspondence uh, theory, um, and the alternative, namely that the Tractatus propounds a semantic or deflationary uh, conception of truth, and I'll uh, reject both of these. Um, then I will uh, home in on what I think is the official theory of truth, uh, of the Tractatus truth as obtaining, uh, depicting and obtaining a state of affairs. Um, and I'll then discuss whether this idea, this official theory of the Tractatus uh, could qualify as a correspondence theory after all. And the final section, this is good, just goes to show how out of the loop I am. Uh, it's only when I started uh, looking at this again uh, two days ago that I found that uh, um, Paudin had, uh, you know, written a rather lengthy um, critique of my position in the International Journal of uh, Philosophical Studies, and I will consider his objection and his idea that truth is a correspondence relation, but an indirect one. Okay, so that's the, the program. All right. Um, so the three themes of my uh, presentation are derived from two publications of mine um, uh, a long time ago, uh, but they are uh, first uh, the need to understand Wittgenstein's um, early discussions of judgment and truth as part of an account of intentionality. And his account of intentionality is nothing other than the famous or infamous picture theory, of the proposition. Secondly, uh, the antecedents of sense, as I call it. Sense, well, a particular uh, notion of sentence meaning or content uh, is prior to both judgment and truth. Without sense, there's nothing to judge and hence there's nothing to be either true or false. And thirdly, this antecedence of sense to questions of fact or truth holds the key to understanding not just what the Tractatus has to say about meaning or sentence sense and uh, about judgment, but also what it has to say about truth. Okay, uh, sense, judgment, truth. Um, I think that uh, one of the uh, profound critiques uh, that Wittgenstein launched against Frege and Russell is that they failed to appreciate the antecedents of sense to judgment and truth. And I, in my turn, will criticize interpretations of the Tractatus, in particular, of uh, its account of truth for ignoring this dependency as well. And actually, that holds you know, uh, uh, also for Poudin's recent uh, offering. Um, so I reject both the view that uh, the Tractatus uh, contains an ordinary correspondence theory and the more recent proposal that it propounds a deflationary or semantic theory. So Wittgenstein's obtainment theory of truth combines a semantic explanation of the relation between a sentence and what it says, its sense, with a deflationary account of the agreement between what the sentence says and what obtains or is the case if it is true. Yeah, so it's a, it's a substantial semantic theory of sentence sense or content um, uh, of what uh, you know is said to be true but um, a deflationary or minimalist account of the what uh, it, it is for what the sentence says to be true okay now what's the track says about well you know i think uh, it, it's obvious that it revolves around the relation between thought and language on the one hand and um, reality or the world on the other. Uh, it's also evident that uh, the interest is not epistemological, but logical or semantic. Um, so uh, what uh, the Tractatus is after is the essence of symbolic representation, what all meaningful propositions have in common, the pro general propositional form, um, as he says in 4.5, is things are thus and so. So the essence of propositions 
uh, is to represent how things are. Uh, furthermore, um, you know, Wittgenstein succumbed to what uh, some have described uh, as an infantile disorder of uh, early analytic philosophy, namely to extensionalism. All meaningful propositions are truth functions of elementary propositions, and all logical relations are due to truth functional composition. Uh, as a result, um, if you want to know what his account of truth is, you can uh, at least make a very credible start by looking what his account of elementary propositions being true or false is. So uh, by accounting for elementary propositions, the picture theory explains the basis of symbolic representation. Okay, now I want to place this in a, in a more general context. I think the picture theory uh, is, uh, uh, you know, really uh, one of the most uh, important attempts to solve certain puzzles about intentionality, what we now call uh, intentionality, um, the fact that thought or language seem to represent um, reality as being a certain way. Um, now, you know, there are two venerable pu puzzles here. One goes back to Plato, and it is the possibility of falsehood. So if a proposition or judgment is true, you know, it seems straightforward, it corresponds to a fact, it depicts how things are in the world. But what if it is false? Um, in that case, no fact corresponds to it. And nevertheless, the proposition remains meaningful. I mean, you know, the, the proposition that uh, grass is red is meaningful, um, but no corresponds, no fact corresponds to it. Now, the second puzzle is, I think, one Wittgenstein discovered, and that is uh, thought or, or uh, propositions reach right up to reality. They don't connect to reality through an intermediary, but I will um, keep that uh, topic uh, for the last section. Okay, right, so Russell's theories of judgment. Now, uh, Russell first had a dual relation theory of judgment. And this dual relation theory of judgment cannot deal with the uh, puzzle of falsehood. Um, uh, Ace believes that ARB cannot be a relation between a subject and an object, a complex object, a fact ARB, for if it is false, nothing in reality corresponds to it, as Russell himself uh, realized. Now he uh, replaced that uh, dual relation theory by a multiple relation theory, which you know holds that believing that A R B is not a relation in which A stands to the complex A R B as a whole, it uh, is to be accounted for in terms of a relation of acquaintance with the compositions of the proposition A R B, um, uh, rather than the proposition as a whole. Um, Oops, I must get rid of the, these pictures. They sort of otherwise will distract me. Okay, um, now uh, Wittgenstein pointed out that, you know, it, just a relation between um, A and these constituents would allow A to judge nonsense, uh, since it's no longer guaranteed that the constituents are combined in a meaningful way. So it would be po uh, possible to judge that the uh, 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 table pen folders the book or something like that. So what we judge to be true must make sense. You know, this is a, the first appearance of the antecedents of sense. Um, okay, so Russell's way out. Um, well, A is acquainted not just with the constituents of the proposition, but also with the logical form, um, which he describes as a completely general fact. So, you know, because um, um, when I believe that A, R, B, I, my, the content of my belief contains this logical form, it is guaranteed that uh, only uh, something which makes sense uh, can be judged. Wittgenstein responded that this conception of logical forms is, is inconsistent. On the one hand, logical forms must be facts, I mean completely general facts, not A, R, B, but X, Phi, Y, um, and that means they must be complex. On the other hand, they are objects of acquaintance, i.e. simple. I mean, and there's a rather ironic 
passage about this in the notes on, uh, on logic. Um, now, the first alternative creates, among other things, the third man regress. Um, it explains why A, R, and B can combine to form certain facts, A, R, B, B, R, A, but not others, R, R, B, or A, B, R, by reference to a further fact. And that, you know, is um, the third man problem, which goes back uh, to Parmenides. I mean, the, 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 the dialogue at Parmenides. Um, now, uh, the second uh, is, uh, uh, conception, namely that um, the logical forms are objects simply as a further constituent to the content of the judgment. And as a further constituent, it can't ensure that uh, the, uh, uh, all of the constituents are combined in a licit way. Um, so, oops. Now, this is, if you wish, the, the uh, uh, situation that Wittgenstein faced when he started to devise the picture theory in 1914. He already uh, also built on three other points. Um, first, propositions, unlike names, are essentially composite. You know, they have a structural component and a structure. They are facts. What represents is not a simple complex, something static, but it is the fact that the components of the proposition are related to each other in a certain fashion. And certainly, um, propositions are bipolar. Uh, they represent reality not by standing for something like a name, but through depicting either truly or falsely how things are. And a proposition must be capable of being true, but also capable of being false. But we you know what still uh, exercised him was what he calls the mystery of negation, or is also the mystery of falsehood. We can say how things are not, and uh, we can also say how things are and fail to get it right. Um, a proposition depicts something, though what it depicts needn't obtain, needn't be the case. For instance, uh, uh, you know, if I think that uh, 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 Trump is president. Um, now, the Tractatus has a way out. Um, a proposition depicts a possibility, a potentiality. It does so not with the help of an additional logical form, an additional relation between its constituents, but simply through the fact that its components are combined in a certain way. So the, uh, uh, the idea that propositions are facts is supposed to solve you know, the problem of the unity of the proposition. Um, now, the possibility of that combination is guaranteed by the combinatorial possibilities of the components of the proposition. And those components, ultimately uh, logically proper names, they mirror uh, uh, the combinatorial possibilities of the things they stand for, uh, the simple objects of uh, Wittgenstein's logical at atomism. Um, now, you know, I'm not going to dwell on whether this works. I don't think it does, uh, but, you know, what does work in philosophy? Anyway, um, so uh, what is important here is the requirements of depiction. What is essential is no fact need correspond to the proposition as a whole. And a meaningful proposition which depicts or represents reality as being a certain way um, um, doesn't need to have a fact corresponding to it, but there needs to be a relation of correspondence. There must uh, be a relation of correspondence between the elements of the proposition and the elements of the depicted situation. Secondly, it must be determined what relationship between the elements uh, of the proposition depict what relationship between the things for which those elements stand or go proxy. Now, if both of these are in place, um, then the fact that the elements of the picture are related to each other in a determinant way represents that the corresponding things are related to each other in a corresponding way, whether or not they actually are. Okay. I, I could illustrate this if this were a lecture, but I, I think I'll let you off on grounds of, of good behavior. Okay, so um, now 
what if you depict falsely? Well, the, the solution to the uh, puzzle of falsehood is that if you depict false, you, you depict a combination of existing elements, but the combination itself doesn't exist. It doesn't obtain. In a proposition, a situation is, as it were, assembled by way of experiment, but you know the experiment can go wrong. Um, you can assemble uh, the um, elements in a way which doesn't correspond to the assembly of the elements in reality. And that you know, really is, in a nutshell, the, the solution to the puzzle of falsehood. Judgment. Um, now, uh, the Tractatus has uh, a few odd things to say about judgment or belief. Uh, it propounds that uh, a sentence like A believes, judges that P, I mean, you know, uh, you know, Othello believes that uh, Desdemona doesn't love him, etc. Um, is, you know, it must be fitted into this idea that in a complex proposition like A, a simple proposition like P uh, can only uh, uh, occur uh, as the basis of a truth functional operation. And so uh, it, 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 the analysis that uh, Wittgenstein presents is intended to avoid the appearance that P can here occur in a non-truth functional way and uh, it also is supposed to avoid the possibility of judging nonsense. So, you know, we all know that, you know, uh, the fact that uh, uh, whether or not um, uh, whatever Merkel believes that um, the Brexit was a good idea, um, you know, the truth of that statement is independent of the truth of the statement uh, Brexit was a good idea. Um, now, uh, the, the solution to this uh, puzzle um, that Wittgenstein comes up with uh, is that a statement of this form ha uh, has to be analyzed as P in inverted commas says P. So what he, uh, we say when we say that uh, Malcolm believes that Brexit was a good idea um, is that um, not that we correlate a possible state of affairs, Brexit being a good idea and a subject marker, but we uh, correlate a possible state of affairs, namely Brexit being a good idea, uh, being a good idea, and a thought constituting fact, um, namely, and it does so. Uh, it correlates these um, uh, a fact and a state of affairs through correlating components, namely elements of thought with elements in reality. So when we say A believes or judges that P, we, uh, what we mean is that A in A there is a mental fact which pictures the fact that P in A there is, if you wish, a, a sentence in the language of thought, thought which pictures, depicts the fact or possible fact that P. Um, so it's not, uh, 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 so, you know, this is supposed to, uh, solve the puzzle both of uh, non-truth functional occurrences of one proposition in a more complex one. It is also supposed to guarantee the meaningfulness of what is judged by insisting that it is not a complex of objects which can be combined in any odd way, but a fact in which, or possible fact, in which objects hang together subject to their combinatorial possibilities. Okay, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, this, this is a rather misguided uh, theory. Um, it does uh, presuppose the obscure idea of a language of thought. In Merkel, there's a sentence in the language of thought which, um, you know, has the content that Brexit is a good idea. Um, uh, you know, it um, denies that there's a unitary subject of belief, which is to be related to um, uh, a, pro a proposition or its components and a logical form. Uh, but in the subject, there are occurrences of thoughts, uh, and these occurrences have word like elements interposed between names on the one hand and objects on the other. Um, so this is all very rum in the later Wittgenstein 
um, well, it's not very rum if you're, you're a Fedorian, I presu uh, suppose. Um, but the later Wittgenstein rejected this view, I think, with uh, very telling arguments. And then a point on which I won't dwell unless you are interested in it in, it in the Q&A. Um, the um, analysis uh, doesn't deliver what it promises to, and I mean, it can't show how you know, the, 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 the believed content P occurs truth functionally in um, the sentence A believes that P or rather in P says P, but you know, I won't dwell on this. Okay, so that's you know, one part of my uh, brief now for truth. Um, I think uh, what Wittgenstein says, has to say on judgment is, is not really uh, very um, uh, productive. But uh, important, but not very productive. Uh, what he has to say about truth, on the other hand, I think is still very relevant and interesting. Now, um, the, to just locate Wittgenstein in the very general area of theories of truth, um, Wittgenstein subscribes to what I call a lethic realism. Um, and that uh, you know, is roughly uh, the statement that uh, there is a conceptual independence between um, uh, something being true and something being believed. So it's the conjunction of first the denial that it is true that P uh, conceptually entails that it is believed that P and uh, of the statement that uh, it is believed that P conceptually entailing that it is true that P. Whether uh, you know, it is true that P depends on how things are, not on what people say or think or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's a very minimalist kind of realism, if you wish, but I, I still think it, it contrasts um, the, uh, uh, you know, many theories of truth from others. Um, now, uh, the correspondence theory is, is a particular form of elithic realism. Um, it is uh, substantially the idea that truth is a relation between a truth bearer, a sentence or judgment or idea or proposition and a truth maker, you know, a fact or reality, etc. And I think that is what is distinctive of classic um, correspondence theories. Now, um, this very uh, general idea can be um, exp you know, explicated in different fashions. And um, one uh, fashion is what I call object correspondence. Incidentally, in, uh, by contrast to uh, most um, accounts of um, uh, the tractatus, I uh, have chosen in my writings to speak of sentences being true because, you know, for certain purposes, one has to distinguish between um, a sentence and, uh, and what it says. But that's why, you know, uh, my variable, my, my uh, free variable is S rather than P. So a sentence S is true if and only if S corresponds to its object. Um, OC is unsatisfactory uh, for cases in which, you know, there is no object uh, that really uh, could anchor the relation of correspondence. So, you know, to what object that's it is raining uh, correspond, uh, let alone statements like nobody is perfect. It's certainly, unless you are a, a Heideggerian, um, it certainly doesn't correspond to an object called nobody or nothing. Okay, so OC is no good. Um, uh, fact correspondence comes in two versions. One is plural. Um, the sentence S isn't true if and only if Eris corresponds to the facts. Um, but what are these facts? Um, so an um, FCP would uh, assign the same truth maker to all truth bearers, to all true propositions. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, for instance, Davidson found offensive, and I think rightly so. Um, it seems that it's not a, uh, explanatory in any way. In fact, one could sus be forgiven for suspecting that corresponding to the facts is simply a, a convoluted way of saying it is true. So more promising um, is FCS, fact correspondence singular. Uh, 
S is true if and only if S corresponds to the fact S expresses, not to the facts generically, but to the fact that S expresses. Um, trouble is, um, you know, uh, this is supposed to hold not just for uh, true uh, propositions, uh, but also, you know, the FCS is supposed to decide whether a proposition is true. And, um, you know, in the case of false propositions, um, uh, this, you know, it can't hold because, uh, you know, there's no fact that uh, a false proposition expresses because by definition, uh, a false proposition doesn't express a fact. It may express a possible fact, but not a fact. Um, and finally, um, fact correspondence existence. S is true if and only if there is a fact to which S corresponds. So, you know, um, it's true if there is a fact to which it corresponds and false otherwise. So that uh, solves, resolves pretty much all of the problems um, uh, we've had so far. But, um, you know, uh, the question is, what does this relation of Rob correspondence amount to? Um, and this is where, you know, I want to switch to, to Ludwig. Yeah, so I think FCE is fine as it stands, but what does it mean uh, uh, for a sentence to correspond uh, to a fact? Okay, uh, not all of the problems which uh, attach to FCE, you know, will make an appearance here, but anyway, so now, um, Standard correspondence interpretations of the tractators, I mean, you know, Haack, for instance, is Haack, uh, and, and others, um, think that um, the tractatus is supposed to give some sort of answer to the question of what correspondence um, can amount to. I mean, they don't distinguish uh, uh, between these different possibilities in the way I've done, but they think that the tractatus um, makes headway by uh, giving a particular explanation of what correspondence to a fact amounts to. And that uh, standard interpretation says that a sentence S is true if and only if S is isomorphic to what S depicts. So, you know, S has the same structure to uh, what uh, it depicts uh, a possible situation. But this interpretation lumbers the text with something which it certainly isn't uh, guilty of. It mistakes a sufficient condition of sense for a sufficient condition of truth. Um, what uh, isomorphism explains in the Tractatus is not truth, but a precondition of truth, namely making sense, depicting a, something as being the case. Here's some textual evidence. There must be something identical in a picture and what it depicts to enable the one to be a picture of the other at all. Um, what the picture must have in common with reality in order to be able to depict it correctly or incorrectly in the way it does is its form of depiction, which it you know, shares with reality. So correctly or incorrectly, the picture represents what it represents independently of its truth or falsehood through its form of depiction. So the standard correspondence interpretation is demonstrably wrong. Um, now, uh, an alternative which you find in the writings uh, of Ansgar Beckermann and a more, in a more cursory fashion in, um, in Peter Hacker is that uh, you know, in the Tractatus, we find a semantic or deflationary uh, account of truth. Uh, Beckermann calls it semantic hacker deflationary. Um, but I think that's uh, a nomenclature. Um, so the idea is um, the sentence S is true if and only if things are as S says they are. Or to uh, uh, quote one of the first occurrences of uh, a redundancy theory, P is true, says nothing else but P. Um, and here, my favorite sentence from the Tractatus, a proposition is true if we use it to say that things stand in a certain way, and they do. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think most theories of truth add to this uh, by way of error rather than insight. Nevertheless, I think uh, the uh, uh, SD interpretation can't uh, stand, uh, 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 so it does, doesn't hold as it stands. Um, so uh, what it ignores are passages which point in the direction of some kind of corresponding theory. Uh, here's one. I don't know how, to, can you hear me? Yes, apologies, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, I, I, I'm not aware of having uh, committed this particular um, uh, crime. Anyway, a picture agrees with reality or fails to agree. It is correct or incorrect, true or false. So here, you know, it's not sense, but being correct or true which uh, is explained in terms of agreement and error in terms of, of, sorry, incorrectness or falsehood in terms of failure to agree. The agreement or disagreement of its sense with reality constitutes uh, the truth or falsity of the picture. In order to tell whether a picture is true or false, we must compare it with reality. I mean, that's, you know, classic correspondence theory stuff. I mean, Schlick loved it when he later uh, read it. Um, now, um, you know, we have these two conflicting uh, sets of evidence, uh, and I'd like to sort of um, find a solution to this puzzle by having a look at what I call the official theory of the Tractatus. Um, it is an account of the elementary proposition, but since everything else follows from the elementary proposition, you know, I think that's... Uh, uh, you know, is not um, a shortcoming. Now, what Wittgenstein says in no uncertain terms, the simplest kind of proposition and the elementary proposition asserts the obtaining of a state of affairs, das Bestehen eines Sachverhalts. If an elementary proposition is true, the state of affairs obtains. If an elementary proposition is false, the state of affairs does not obtain. Now you remember I said that you know the solution to the puzzle of falsehood, uh, possibility of falsehood is that for a Wittgenstein proposition depicts um, a possibility. Now uh, here we get the official theory of the tractatus. Um, a sentence is true if and only if the state of affairs the sentence depicts obtains, and now. Um, uh, through uh, a sequence of uh, moves, which I don't think are quick and dirty, although each one of them you know, might merit further comment, I will turn this into a version of the correspondence theory. S is true if and only if S depicts an obtaining state of affairs. That's just a reformulation. Um, and since uh, an obtaining state of affairs is a fact, uh, we get S is true if and only if S depicts a fact. And that can be reformulated into S is true if and only if there is a fact S depicts. And now, you know, we just uh, uh, repair for FCE. S is true if and only if there is a fact to which S corresponds. So, uh, you know, uh, what we have is um, a way of turning the obtainment theory of truth um, into a, well, a version of the correspondence theory, but uh, here the correspondence is one of depiction. You know, what, what uh, uh, the, the correspondence relation is the one between um, the uh, uh, sentence or proposition and a possible uh, fact or state of affairs. Okay. Now, uh, so on the one hand, uh, uh, the obtainment theory differs from the semantic deflationary account because it includes an ontology of states of affairs and facts. I mean, you know, these all have components and it gets frightfully complicated. Um, and it differs from uh, their favorite account in explicitly featuring a relation, namely depiction. On the other hand, this relation is not truth-making. Um, it obtains between any meaningful sentence and its sense, any meaningful sentence and 
you know, what is its, its meaning, namely the possible state of affairs it depicts. Um, what makes for truth is rather the obtaining of the depicting state, the depicted state of affairs. And, you know, that's nothing, other, you know, there's no, there's no uh, difference between the state of affairs uh, uh, depicted uh, uh, incorrectly and the state of affairs depicted correctly in terms of the one sentence being related to one kind of entity and the other to another kind of entity. It's just that a possible combination of objects can either obtain or not obtain. Uh, there's no additional layer here depicting reality via um, a set of possible states of affairs, which are extra entities. The possible state of affairs that Trump lost the election is identical with the fact that Trump lost the election. Okay, now is this a correspondence theory after all? Oops, 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 oops. Um, now the fact that there is no uh, truth making relation here doesn't automatically disqualify OT from being a correspondence theory. It's an un unappreciated fact um, uh, that, well, first of all, I think the idea of truth making uh, uh, is, is incoherent. Um, but I won't dwell on that. Um, uh, but it's an uh, under under uh, explored fact that Moore and Russell were committed to a very similar position. Here's Moore to say that this belief is true is to say that there is in the universe a fact to which it corresponds, and to say that it is false is to say that there is not in the universe any fact to which it corresponds. And if we just say, well, that means. Um, there is, you know, this belief is false if in the universe there is no uh, fact which it depicts, then we have Ludwig. Um, and here's Russell, a belief is true when there's a corresponding fact and false when there's no corresponding fact for corresponding redepiction. And um, you have uh, you know, something which is compatible with the tractatus. So I, you know, reach an ironic conclusion, semantic, uh, deflationary and correspondent theories could all agree on dividing the explanation of truth into two parts. One, which is, you know, is the semantic uh, theory about making sense, which explains the relation between a sentence, what it says or depicts in the fashion of a semantic theory and another which explains the equivalence between what the sentence says and what is the case in a deflationary manner. You know, between, you know, uh, there, there is uh, you know, no uh, relation, no general relation between what I claim in claiming that Trump lost the election and what is actually the case. All right, I, I mean, in, in view of the time, I think I should stop here and perhaps uh, uh, leave what I have to say uh, in response to uh, Claude uh, for the discussion, if people are really keen. Thank you. Uh, the next talk will be given by Jose Zalabardo, who is a professor of philosophy at the University College London. He is the author of Introduction to the Theory of Logic, published with Wesley in 2000, Skepticism and Reliable uh, Belief, published with Oxford University Press in 2012, and Representation and Reality in Wittgenstein's Tractatus, published by Oxford University Press as well in 2015. He also uh, published numerous journal articles and books chapters, and he is the editor of Wittgenstein's Early Philosophy, published with Oxford University Press in 2015. He is currently working on a new pragmatist account of representation and preparing a monograph on the subject. The topic of his talk today is uh, Tractatus on Semantic Unity. And so thank you for, to this organization and to the organizers for doing this and for inviting me. Uh, it's a great thing. And thank you to the rest of you for being here. Now, I should have paid more attention to what others were talking about because my subject matter, the topic of my talk is very close to Hanya's. Uh, and indeed, my approach is not a million miles away from his. There are aspects of what he said that I would um, perhaps disagree with, but I think in the fundamentals, we are very much in agreement. One point on which we are very much um, 
speaking uh, from the same point of view is the importance of uh, Russell's theories of judgment to understand what Wittgenstein was trying to do in the Tractatus. Uh, Hanyo has given us an account of uh, the detail of how that influence goes. I'm going to give uh, perhaps a slightly different uh, account. I won't be referring to Hanyo. Uh, we can perhaps talk about possible differences or similarities uh, in discussion later on. Okay, now I should preface this um, with uh, the uh, proviso, right? Uh, I'm not committing myself that, to the idea that Wittgenstein's ultimate goal is to propound philosophical theories. I know this is a big issue and people have <laughs> wanted to talk about this all the time instead of what I would rather talk about. So all I'm doing is Suppose that Wittgenstein, suppose that the Tractatus was propounding some philosophical theories. My question on that assumption is, well, what are those theories and what problem are they trying to solve? So down to the uh, matter uh, itself. Um, one thing I think is clear. Wittgenstein thought that there was a serious problem with the idea that we can represent things as being a certain way in mind and language. He didn't think that this ability of yours, this ability of ours was straightforward. It needed to be explained and there was a big problem with trying to explain it. That I think is fairly uncontroversial. I think it's also fairly uncontroversial that he's putting forward his picture theory as his solution to that problem. Okay, whatever the problem is, it's a problem that he thought was solving with his picture theory of the proposition. The question is, what problem is that? Now, um, I think, and I think in this I'm in agreement with Hanio, that the problem is one that Russell had tried to solve with his theories of judgment uh, first, and then of understanding in the 1913 manuscript. Uh, Wittgenstein was, of course, well familiar with Russell's attempt to solve these problems but he thought that Russell had failed. Uh, uh, Russell's solution for Wittgenstein just didn't work. And what he was trying to do, what Wittgenstein was trying to do was to improve on Russell's solution to overcome the obstacle that he thought invalidated Russell's attempt. So what's the obstacle? Now, I think the obstacle is uh, the problem of the unity of the proposition. Um, Hanyo has used uh, this label, so to that extent, I think we are very much in agreement. I think the specific account of how or what that problem is might, the one that I would want to defend, will differ slightly from the, the where Hanyo had put the emphasis. Now, the problem of unity is often described as having two versions, the problem of metaphysical unity and the problem of semantic unity. Now, I think that the picture theory is addressed at the problem of semantic unity. I think that Wittgenstein has something to say about metaphysical unity as well, but that's what he has to say about that is not something I want to discuss today. I think it's a separate aspect of his thought. But we need to refer briefly to metaphysical unity. What's that problem? Well, I think the problem of metaphysical unity uh, uh, arises when you adopt a specific metaphysics, a specific account of facts. That account is an account according to which facts are produced by the combination into a unity of some more basic items. individuals, properties, relations, stuff like that. Those are the ultimate building blocks of the universe and facts are combinations of those. That's what I'm calling the combinatorial account of facts and the problem of metaphysical unity is a problem that arises for that position. Because once you have that account, you need to explain what the difference is between the uncombined constituents and the unity that we call the fact that's produced when those uh, items are combined with 
one another. What's the difference between a possible universe in which um, uh, Plato, in, in Plato is sitting and another possible universe in which Plato exists and the property of sitting exists, but Plato isn't sitting. Uh, that is, uh, in a nutshell, what I'm calling the problem of metaphysical unity. As I say, what Wittgenstein here in this particular aspect of his thought is interested in is the problem of semantic unity. Now, the problem of semantic unity uh, is one that you face uh, when you make a very natural move, which is to exploit the combinatorial account of facts to explain propositional representation. The idea there is that language and the mind make contact with the world in the first instance, not at the level of facts, I'm not connected with a fact when I represent things as being a certain way, but at the level of the constituents, that the constituents whose combination, the idea is that the language makes, language and the mind make contact with the world at the level of those items in the world whose combination produces the facts. And if you have that view, then you face the problem of semantic unity. You need to explain how just the list of words differs from a sentence, what is added by a sentence, uh, um, as opposed to just uh, um, having a list of words that results in you representing things as being a certain way, rather than just listing uh, um, certain items in the world that your words refer to. Or in the mental case, what is the difference between actually judging that things are thus and so on the one hand, and on the other, just bringing to consciousness one after the other or simultaneously those items whose combination you want, you want to represent as obtaining. Now this, I say, is the problem that ultimately they uh, the picture theory is meant to address. Now, of course, as um, Hanyo has explained very well, this is uh, precisely um, um, the, kind of, the kind of position that Russell's mi multiple relation theory exemplifies. There are, of course, other instances of this. I mean, most of naturalized semantics of the end of the 20th century take exactly this form at this very abstract level. Now, the problem of unity is a problem that plagues all versions of this move, and it plagues Russell's multiple relation theory. Now, Russell at first wasn't aware of this problem. Uh, it uh, became gradually uh, more aware of of its importance. At first, he thought that it was just the problem of direction or order under a different name, but then he realized possibly, probably I'd say, under, uh, the, uh, pressure, under pressure from Wittgenstein, that there was a separate problem. And by 1913, by the time he wrote the, uh, what's now known as the theory of knowledge manuscript, he was fully aware of this problem. Now, here's a list of quotes from the Theory of Knowledge Manuscript, where Russell presents the problem, which I'm saying is a version of the problem of semantic unity and the problem that Wittgenstein is trying to solve. So he says that, Russell says that in order to understand what someone says when they say that Socrates precedes Plato, it is necessary to understand, he says, how Socrates and Plato and precedes are to be combined. So not just which things are to be combined, but how they are to be combined with one another. Again, understanding the statement A is similar to B would not be possible, he says, unless we knew how they, A, B, and similarity are to be put together. It's the mode of combination that seems to be uh, the problem. Um, Another passage, in order to understand the proposition A precedes B, in addition to knowing what is meant by the words that occur in it, here he says, it is also necessary to know how these three items, A, B, and preceding, are to be combined. And the last passage, in order to understand A and B are similar, 
we must know what is supposed to be done with A and B and similarity, that is what it is for two terms to have a relation. That is, we must understand the form of the complex which must exist if the proposition is true. Incidentally, uh, people have said sometimes that you know, what was worrying Russell was the problem of direction. That's, that's demonstrably false, right? In the, in the manuscript, he explicitly says that he's going to use examples like A is similar to B in which order does not matter in order to make it clear that that is not what he is talking about. He might have previously thought that they were uh, the same problem, but he's now fully aware that they are not. So the problem is, uh, just to give a sort of brief formulation, what I would want to call the mode of combination problem. The problem is that representing things as being a certain way involves representing certain items as combined with one another in a certain way. The items, for example, would be Socrates, precedence, the relation of precedence and Plato. And then there is this, the way in which they are represented as combined, in this case, by the, the logical relation of binary instantiation. That's the problem that the Russell was trying to solve in 1913. And that's the problem I'm claiming that Wittgenstein wanted to solve with his picture theory. Now, Russell's solution, as I think Hanyo has mentioned as well, involves the notion of forms, okay? This is uh, another quote from Theory of Knowledge where Russell says what his account of judgment or understanding is. He says, if we call the subject S and the relating relation of which understanding is the one presupposed by all others, you, but you can plug in judgment if you want, and the objects X, R, Y, taking the case of a proposition asserting a dual relation for the sake of illustration, and gamma, the form of dual complexes, the total complex which occurs when the subject has the relation U to the objects in question may be symbolized by U of S, X, R, Y, gamma. So if in, the, in Russell's own example, we're talking about Othello believing that Desdemona loves Cassio. Uh, we need as relata, Othello, Desdemona, Cassio, love, and this is the novelty, the form of dual complexes. Previously, in previous versions of the multiple relation theory, they form did not figure as an additional relatum, okay? Now, forms. Um, what are they? What, how do they come into the picture? I think as far as I know, they first appear in, the, in Russell's writings, and correct me if this is wrong because I'm by no means a Russell scholar, but the first, the first reference that I, I've, I've come across is in a manuscript from 1912. Uh, which is a repeated more or less verbatim in the 1913 uh, manuscript. He says, it is obvious in fact, that when all the constituents of a complex have been enumerated, there remains something which may be called the form of the complex, which is the way in which the constituents are combined in the complex. There's a thing which is the way in which the constituents are combined in the complex. And by reference to that item, he's hoping to solve the problem of motor combination or the problem of semantic unity. Again, another quote, he says, the form is not a thing, not another constituent along with the objects that were previously related in that form. Now, his insistence that it can't be a constituent, uh, he justifies explicitly in the rest of the passage by reference to Bradley's regress, okay? The idea is that if it was just another constituent, then the question would arise, well, how is that constituent related to the rest of the constituents, et cetera? So that's about it's not being a constituent, uh, but it, about it's not being a thing, he clearly does not mean that because here's another quote from uh, Theory of Knowledge where he says, if there is such a thing as acquaintance with forms, as there is good reason to believe that there is, then a form must be a genuine object. So forms exist 
Forms are grasped uh, by the mind through the relation of acquaintance and they're absolutely real things. And it can, Russell has a, a very precise theory about their nature. Uh, it's actually, that's actually quite interesting, but uh, uh, for the sake of moving on, I won't, I won't go into that. Now, um, that's, that was Russell, now Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein clearly was very interested in this aspect of Russell's thought. He seems to, his attitude seems to be, oh, this, this, this is almost right, except that for this to be right, forms need to be available and forms need to do the job that Russell assigns to them, but he can't bring himself to believe that. So here's what he says already in the notes of logic dictated just a few months after Russell wrote uh, the theory of knowledge manuscript. He says, there is no thing which is the form of a proposition and no name which is the name of a form. Accordingly, we can also not say that the relation which in certain cases holds between things holds sometimes between forms and things. This goes against Russell's theory of judgment. Okay, I take it that that relation he's alluding to is the relation of acquaintance, but that, that doesn't really matter. Um, and then from the notebooks, we get this other passage to, which comes to the same point. He says, then we can ask ourselves, does the subject predicate form exist? Does the relational form exist? Do any of the forms exist at all that Russell and I were always talking about? Russell would say, yes, that's self-evident. Ha, that's uh, Wittgenstein's uh, refutation of Russell. Now, um, it's a very interesting issue how precisely Russell is hoping to use forms to solve the problem of the mode of combination. It's not the straightforward attempt that you might be imagining that is uh, obviously open to a version of Bradley's rigorous. I think his, his uh, strategy is more sophisticated than that and indeed closer to what Wittgenstein ended up doing. But again, I don't want to go into that. In my book, I sort of present my hypothesis as to how Russell was hoping to solve this problem, but uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into this here. Let's just re recapitulate what we've said so far. So Russell wanted to solve the problem of semantic unity. He realized that, that was a problem and that that was a problem for his theory of judgment. His solution involves forms, but Wittgenstein doesn't think that forms are up to the task. He doesn't think that they're available to do the job that Russell wants to do with them. And to me, his preoccupation with this issue suggests that he's in engaging with the problem of semantic unity. If forms are supposed to solve this problem, why would Wittgenstein care so much about forms if he wasn't interested in the very same problem? And indeed, in the pre tractarian manuscripts, there's tons of uh, passages in which he offers better and worse attacks on the idea of form and on Russell's specific account of what forms are. So I think that Wittgenstein clearly thought that the problem had to be solved and he thought he had a solution. What is his solution? Well, here, I think I'm only going to add some details to what David Pears uh, said uh, decades ago about the difference between what he calls, what Pears calls Russell's Platonism and Wittgenstein's Aristotelianism. Russell solves the problem by saying, look, there's this thing, the form which the mind grasps and by doing something with it, once it's been grasped, will solve the problem. Wittgenstein doesn't think that there are forms. What he thinks there are, well, he tells us that right at the beginning of the tractatus, doesn't he? What there are is facts, okay? That's what there are, well, that's what there is. Ultimately, the world is the totality of facts. Now, those facts are complex, and in those facts, objects are combined with one another, and they are combined with one another in a certain way, 
You can say all that without yet saying that the form is a thing. You're just saying there is a fact, it's got constituents. And you can point at the fact and say, see, look at how the constituents of that fact are combined with one another in that fact. Look at the mode of combination exemplified by the constituents of that fact. So the form is, so, is seen as inherent in the facts as opposed to uh, as sort of separate, separate items. I, I take it that that's what justifies Peirce's uh, label of Aristotelianism. Now, those facts whose mode of combination is exploited for the purpose of representing things as being a certain way without falling prey to the problem of the mode of combination are precisely Wittgenstein's pictures. Okay. Uh, these are passages that uh, Hanyo has quoted and or alluded to. He says very clearly what constitutes a picture is that its elements are related to one another in a determinate way. I'm using Pears and McGuinness's uh, translation, but the passages are the same that Hanyo uh, mentioned, obviously. It's the fact that they are that they are related to one another in a certain way, in a determinate way, that uh, the emphasis is put on. A picture is a fact. And that you can use for representing things as being a certain way. Because the fact that the elements of a picture are related to one another in a determinate way can be used to represent that things are related to one another in the same way. Okay? You extract, as a process of abstraction, if you will, the mode of combination from the picture, in fact, and you say that mode of combination, that's the mode of combination that I'm representing things in the world as exemplifying. Um, that mode of combination that pictures uh, uh, contain and um, and contribute to the process of picturing is what he calls a pictorial form. Again, Hanyo quoted these passages in the other translation. If a fact is to be a picture, it must have something in common with what it depicts. I take that to be the mode of combination. There must be something identical in a picture and what it depicts to enable the one to be a picture of the other at all. What has to be identical in a picture and what it depicts is the pictorial form of the picturing fact, the way in which its constituents are combined with one another. What a picture must have in common with reality in order to be able to depict it correctly or incorrectly in the way it does is its pictorial form. Now, we are only one step away from his account of how we represent the world in mind and language. So far, we just have an abstract model. You know, pictures, if they exist, would represent the world like that. Here's a, here's a possible method of representation that doesn't suffer from the problem of the unit of semantic unity. Now, the step that we still need to take is to explain that for Wittgenstein, uh, thoughts and sentences or propositions are pictures of a very special kind. They are what he calls logical pictures. He introduces the notion in these passages. He says a picture whose pictorial form is logical form is called a logical picture. And he adds, every picture is at the same time a logical one. On the other hand, not every picture is, for example, a spatial one. What's going on here? Well, it seems to me that what's going on here is not particularly complicated. Uh, um, um, so let me explain what I the, the simple move that is being performed here, I think. Um, a picture is a fact. Let's take that literally. So you've got a bottle behind the cup on, on your desk, and you take that fact, the fact that the bottle is behind the cup, whose constituents are combined with one another. You can think of the mode of combination as a spatial mode of combination. The bottle and the cup are the constituents, and they are combined by the behind, you know, being behind a relation, which is a spatial relation. 
Now, if you now make the, bo the bottle go proxy for the pencil and the cup for the sharpener, you can say, look, I'm representing the pencil and the sharpener as combined with one another in the way in which the bottle and the cup are actually combined in this fact which I've grasped. That is the first being behind the second, okay? It seems to me that, that this is a textbook example of what Wittgenstein is calling pictorial representation. Now, this picture is spatial. It's logical, but not only logical. To get a logical picture, you can uh, use exactly the same fact as your picture in fact, but you need a different analysis of that fact. Originally, we had the bottle and the cup as the constituents and the behind relation as the way in which the constituents are combined. In this alternative higher level analysis, what you say is that the constituents are not just the bottle and the cup, but also the behind relation and that the mode of combination is the way in which those three items are combined. That is a logical relation, the relation that we would call binary instantiation. And that opens up a whole range of representational possibilities, right? Because when you used the previous analysis, you could only represent one thing as being behind another. But now, when the behind relation is itself a constituent that needs to be combined with some relation, you can represent any object as bearing any relation to any object. So if you pair the bottle with the pencil and the cup with the sharpener as before, and then you pair in addition the behind relation with the heavier than relation, you can again apply the same template at this higher level and say, the pencil, the sharpener, and the heavier than relation are related to one another. I am representing them as related to one another as the bottle, the behind relation, and the cup are related to one another in my picturing fact. Okay. Um, this, he claims, solves the problem. And again, this is a point where I would want to put emphasis on exactly the same point as Hanyo. Hanyo has given, has attached a lot of importance to how, how falsehood was, uh, the, you know, in one way of seeing it, the central problem for Wittgenstein. And I think that's absolutely right. And he sort of repeatedly, obsessively explains that, you know, what he says, what he's achieved is to make room for false representation. This is a picture represents its subject from a position outside it. Its, side, its standpoint is its representational form. That is why a picture represents its subject correctly or incorrectly. A picture agrees with reality or fails to agree. It is correct or incorrect, true or false. What the picture represents, it represents independently of its truth or falsity by means of its pictorial form. By taking that uh, uh, external standpoint that fulcrum is able to produce a representation of things as being a certain way, which may or may not be the way things actually stand in the world. Right, so far, as I've said, we only have this abstract model. Uh, pictures can represent things in the way we described, and that has advantages. That's what we've said so far. That's what we, all Wittgenstein has said so far. But once he's introduced all these technical apparatus, he tells us very clearly what he wants to use it for. He says, a logical picture of a fact is a thought. So he's just told us what the logical picture of a fact is. He now says, you understand that? Well, that's what thoughts are. And likewise for propositions, because he says in a proposition, a thought finds an expression that can be perceived by the senses. Now, since propositions and thoughts are pictures, everything that we've said, that he said about pictures will apply to propositions and thoughts. But in case we've forgotten, he repeats the same points, exactly the same points that he's made about pictures. He makes them now 
about uh, thought and propositions. He says, what constitutes a propositional sign is that in it, its elements, the words, stand in a determinate relation to one another. A propositional sign is a fact. A proposition is not a blend of words, just as a theme in music is not a blend of notes. A proposition is articulate. And only facts can express a sense. A set of names cannot. Okay. Now, uh, if people have said repeatedly that this is something that this is an idea that occurred to Wittgenstein in the trenches in World War II when he read something about uh, some court case in, in Paris, I can't see how that's possibly true. Here's the notes of logic, October 1913. Propositions, which are symbols having reference to facts, are themselves facts that this ink pot is on the table may express that I sit in this chair. That I think is the core of the solution that to the problem of unity that he then presents as his picture theory. Now, I think this is meant to be taken seriously. And if, as many people say, this is supposed to result in a contradiction that makes philosophy dissolve, then so be it. But that's only going to happen if we take it seriously. He is saying that a sentence is a fact that represents the world pictorially. How can that be? Take the sentence, Pavarotti admires callous. Now, if that's a picture, then it's a fact. What fact is it? Well, he has one possibility, which was contemplated by the early uh, commentators on the tractatus. It's the fact that the three words, Pavarotti admires and callous are concatenated with one another in that order, okay? Now, if that's how it's supposed to be done, obviously this is completely unpromising, okay? Because if we make the word Pavarotti stand for uh, the singer and the word admires stand for the admiration relation and the word callous stand for the other singer, or what we're representing is one singer uh, being concatenated with some relation and some other singer. Now, surely that's not all that we want to represent uh, with sentences. It's way too restrictive. It can't be right. Okay. And I think this is, and I think everyone agrees by now, this is not the right, this is not what Wittgenstein had in mind. Because Wittgenstein, and I think Hanyo also mentioned this, wants to say that there's a, a match between the combinatorial possibilities of the reference of words and the words themselves, okay? So an individual is denoted by an individual word and a relation like admiration has to be denoted by a relation, okay? So I think more you know, closer to Wittgenstein's idea would be to say that the, the fact that we are to identify with the sentence Pavarotti admires colors has to be something like this, that Pavarotti, that the word Pavarotti bears to the word colors a certain relation, call it rho, which is the relation that one item bears to the other when the first item is to the left of the second with the word admires between them. Okay, it's a typographic relation, if you will. Now, that doesn't seem to move matters, does it? Because all we can do now is to say that one singer is sitting to the left of another singer with the word admires between them. Again, falls well short of the kind of things that we want to represent with sentences. But one more step will take us to what we want. It's just to remind ourselves that uh, sentences, propositions are not just any old pictures, they are logical pictures, okay? So what we are to think is that the fact that the word Pavarotti bears relation row to the word callous represents the referent of Pavarotti and the referent of callous 
uh, and the referent of the relation rho, which would be the admiration relation, as combined with one another in that same way in which the words are combined with one another. That is the first and the second being uh, uh, that pair being an instance of their relation. Okay, so that is, I think, how pictures, sorry, how sentences can be regarded as pictures literally in Wittgenstein's sense. I think this is actually what he's telling us in this otherwise obscure passage where he says, instead of the complex sign ARB says that A stands to be in the relation R, we ought to put that quotes A stands to quotes B in a certain relation says that A, R, B. I think that's, I think the explanation that just gave is me making the point that this passage makes. Now, where are we? We first said that pictures in Wittgenstein's sense have a way of representing the world that has great virtues. It uh, has the potential to overcome the problem of um, unity. Now we've had Wittgenstein assert that propositions are pictures, and obviously if they are, then they will inherit the virtues of pictures. What we haven't been given yet is a reason for thinking that this is really how linguistic and mental representation operates, okay? I think that the underlying reason, what convinces Wittgenstein that they are like that in his you know, undoubtedly dogmatic uh, uh, attitude is to say, look, you know, the mode of formulation problem, the problem of unity is a serious problem. There's two ways of solving it. There's Russell's and there's mine. There's no other. Russell's doesn't work, therefore mine is correct. Really, I think that's what convinces Wittgenstein that the picture theory is correct. However, in addition, he actually gives us an argument for thinking that propositions really are pictures as he says they are. And I think I'm going to have to finish with uh, an explanation of what I take that argument to be. That happens in the four zeros, where he, after having done a lot of other stuff, he comes back to the, the picture theory of the proposition. He just clearly brings us back to that uh, constellation of topics. He says, a proposition is a picture of reality, as if nothing had happened in between. A proposition is a model of reality as we imagine it. Now, after that, we have a, a whole list of uh, sections that are numerically dependent on 401. And after that has happened, you get 402. He says, we can see this from the fact that we understand the sense of a propositional sign without its having been explained to us. Now, the referent of this, if you look around for the previous passages, is nowhere to be found. It's clearly 401. What we can see from the fact that so and so is that a proposition is a picture of reality. And indeed, he explains that in the next section. He says, a proposition is a picture of reality. For if I understand the proposition, and I know the situation that it represents and I understand the proposition without having its sense explained to me. So I think that this is clearly meant as a, an argument for thinking that propositions are pictures. The claim that propositions are pictures is supposed to follow from the fact that you can understand a proposition without having something explained to you, okay? The fact that understanding a proposition does, that there's something that you don't need to be to have explained to you in order to understand the proposition, that is what is supposed to convince us that propositions are pictures. So what is that something that doesn't need to be explained to you 
for you to understand the proposition. Well, here's what does need to be explained to you. He says in the same set of sections, he says, the meanings of simple signs, words, must be explained to us if we are to understand them. So you've got the proposition. It consists of words. Their meanings, their reference need to be explained to you. If you don't know what the words stand for, you won't understand the proposition. But that's it. Once you understand the proposition, once, once you understand the words, you know which constituents are to be combined with one another in order for things as you represent them. Which, which items in the world you are, represented, you are representing as combined with one another. Now that needs to be explained to you. So what is it that doesn't need to be explained to you? Well, I think the answer is, well, to my mind, fairly obvious. What doesn't need to be explained to you is the mode of combination. It doesn't need to be explained to you how the proposition represents those things are combined. You need to know which things they are, but not the mode of combination. Now that is for Wittgenstein what shows that propositions are pictures because on the picture theory, a proposition is a fact. Grasping the proposition involves grasping that fact. And grasping that fact, like grasping any fact, involves grasping how its constituents are combined with one another. So, so long as you grasp the proposition at the syntactic level, right, we're not talking about reference yet, you know which mode of combination is being transferred on to the world. That doesn't need to be explained to you. That's inherent in your grasp of the propositional sign of the depicting uh, fact. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. And thank you for accepting our invitation. I, I, I think I, I skipped that before, <laughs> sorry. Which features Juliet Floyd, who is a professor of philosophy at the Boston University and currently president of the uh, SSHAP, which is the Society for the Study of the History of Analytical Philosophy. Her research spans from the history and philosophy of logic to mathematics, language, symbolism, and media, focusing especially on the history of the 20th century of philosophy and Wittgenstein, the Vienna Circle, Gödel, Turing, Quine, Patna, Ambrose, and Cavill but also on philosophical aspects of emerging media. Her recent books include Wittgenstein's Annotations to Hard Discourse of Pure Mathematics, an investigation of Wittgenstein's non-extensionalist understanding of the real numbers, uh, with Felix Mühlhölzer, uh, published by Springer in 2020, and uh, Wittgenstein's Philosophy of Mathematics, published with Cambridge University Press in 2021. She has uh, co-edited several volumes, including Philosophy of uh, Emerging Media with uh, James Katz, uh, published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2016, Philosophical Explorations of the Legacy of Alan Turing, Turing 100, with uh, Bokulic, uh, published by Springer in 2017, and uh, Stanley Cavill's um, must we mean what we say at 50 with Craig Chase and Sandra uh, Lodger, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. Uh, the topic of her talk today is truth uh, in early Wittgenstein and Gödel, and as before, uh, Julie will, will be sharing the slides and the, the abstract in the, in the chat. Uh, Julia, thank you for accepting our invitation and I, I look forward for your, to your talk. Thank you so much, Nicolanta, and thank you all for being here. I guess I'm the closer, as we say in baseball. That means I come last and people are kind to stay around so long. Uh, Hanyo and Jose have given me a lot to think about today. So I'm going to, so this is my tribute partly to Vienna. This year is the centennial of the Tractatus, but also of course, the 90th anniversary of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So. This talk was given in Vienna as a kind of tribute, and I'm going to keep three balls in the air. It's a bit of a juggler's talk. I have Russell and uh, Wittgenstein and Gödel. 
thankfully, Hans Yo <laughs> Han Yo and Jose have already covered the multiple relation theory in detail, and I find myself in, in vast agreement with a lot of what they said. So I can rely on people having heard of this theory, and therefore I hope to finish in 40 minutes. So I'll first talk about truth as an issue for these three. Then we'll talk a bit about the MRT, but I'll zoom through that quickly because you've, you've heard about the multiple relation theory of truth. And then at the end, I'll say something about Gödel's way of reworking the Tractatus's relationship to Russell on the multiple relation theory, which is a very fascinating thing. And Gödel was very well aware of the issues that Hanyo and uh, Jose have been discussing in terms of the dialectic between Wittgenstein and Russell. So a hundred years later, I think that we are very interested, the general public, in the question, what is it to be committed to exact thinking about truth? So Kellyanne Conway says there are alternative facts. What she meant, of course, is that there are alternative interpretations of the facts. Twitter lights up, the public knows, there's something in the notion or the grammar of fact that constrains. And um, so historically, again, Vienna, Carl Zygmunt's book, Exact Thinking in Demented Times is highly relevant. He of course titled his history of the Vienna Circle that way for a reason. And so I'm, I'm really thinking about this general question as I go through these people today. So the question is how did the Tractatus and Gödel attempt to achieve exact thinking about truth? And part of the answer is that they were both crucially inspired by Russell. And not only I think the specific multiple relation theory, but I think the approach to truth that that theory instantiates. So I think I'm going to be contextualizing, in a sense, this discussion we've been having today so far in those terms. So Russell's theory of truth in Principia, which is what the MRT is, he first advocates the theory in Principia in the heart of a formalized document. And both Wittgenstein and Gödel were taken by Principia. And that's where I think they entered and really uh, hit their teeth on the MRT. Now, what's important is that, sorry, the MRTJ, the multiple relation theory is not a linguistic theory of truth, at least on my reading. And Hanyo, I'm not sure whether I'm really differing with you or not. Uh, the idea is it's not conventionalism. It's a view of true judgment as in some sense correspondence, but I quite agree with Han Yo that correspondence cannot be understood in the usual sense. Um, it takes the notion of error to be fundamental to the problem of the distinction between truth and falsity, and therefore the notion of belief. And so I, I agree with what's been said about the notion of belief and belief ascriptions being very central to what Wittgenstein tries to do. And I also agree very much that Russell's approach serves as a counterpoint to deflationism or disquotationalism about truth. Uh, it shows that the history of the Vienna circle um, is not merely conventionalistic, but that there are, so to speak, realistic strands lying in the development of analytic philosophy from that point, not least because Russell was so important for the circle. Now we have Jan Walensky here to, to talk about Tarski. So I'll just say that obviously Tarski made the concept of truth in some sense kosher for the Vienna circle as indicated by Carnap's turn towards semantics. And there's no doubt that Tarski rigorized the notion of a definable set mathematically. But Tarski leaves the problem of where truth enters the hierarchy alone. And neither Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, Gödel, or in fact Turing felt that Tarski had done much philosophically with the notion of truth. Even Quine as a naturalistic philosopher needed to address this issue. So the problem is primordial. How do we get to the distinction between truth and falsity? You have to get there first and you have to get there in such a way that something can be said about error. And Tarski doesn't do that. Okay, now here is Russell on James's conception of truth. And I think it's very important to put James into the picture, particularly if we're gonna talk about belief descriptions in the Tractatus. 
I think there is an impression, writes Russell, in the mind of William James, as of some other pragmatists, that pragmatism involves a more open mind than its opposite. As regards scientific questions, or even the less important questions of philosophy, this is no doubt more or less the case. But as regards the fundamental questions of philosophy, especially as regards what I consider the fundamental question, and that's Russell's italics, by the way, namely the nature of truth, pragmatism is absolutely dogmatic. Dogmatism is fund in fundamentals is more or less unavoidable in philosophy. And I do not blame pragmatists for what could not be otherwise, but I demur to their claim to a greater open-mindedness than is or may be possessed by their critics. So that's a very interesting quote. And I think it left its mark very much on both Wittgenstein and Gödel. Avoid dogma so far as possible in treating the fundamental question with exactitude while granting pragmatism a place in scientific theorizing in everyday life. I really think all of Wittgenstein's philosophy, early, middle, and late, sets itself this task in part. And so I would argue does Gödel's, even though Gödel is often regarded as paradigmatically dogmatic when it comes to notions like fact and Platonism. So I'm offering a, a much more revisionary view of Gödel than I am of Wittgenstein in light of what Hanyo and Jose have done. So the Tractatus elucidates the notion of truth as something formal, shown in the possible activity for any language capable of saying how things are, of formally constructing sentences logically step-by-step step, from a basis of logically simple elementary sentences that may be used to affirm or deny precise truths and falsehoods. So it's a well-founded view of how you would construct the hierarchy. Truth is shown to be a task or activity. That is to say, not something dogmatically presented. And I would not disagree with what Hanya said about the priority of sense in a sense over truth. We see the general form of proposition, what's common to all truths in seeing the possibility of this task of displaying truth conditions, the possibilities of truth and falsity for the totality of sentences in our language. But I would insist, and perhaps here I have a disagreement with Jose about Wittgenstein's actualism. What we see in Wittgenstein are possibilities, not actualities. And I think it remains very important to Wittgenstein's philosophy throughout his life. We make claims, we make assertions about what's true and false, but we also have the capacity to regard our claims as instantiating one possibility among others. That is fundamental to logic. It's fundamental to our capacity to do philosophy. And I really think that's incredibly important for the Tractatus, especially even the later philosophy. So the Tractatus does not pronounce on what the elementary sentences are or must be like. That's one reason I don't think actualism can quite be right. Logic is not a theory, it's an activity. It's a way of presenting forms, logical features and commonalities among thoughts that display thoughts and themselves in our uses of language. Forms show themselves in logic and very crucially, and for me, this is the most important sentence of the Tractatus at the moment, 2.033, form is the possibility of structure. So we do have to differentiate between the structure which would be an embodied sentence used to affirm or deny, and the possibility of that structure, the way in which that structure realizes one possibility among others. And I take it that the notion of possibility here is not analyzed in terms of possible worlds or truth makers, it's primitive. So Wittgenstein's move in general, I think, was to bring modality back into early analytic philosophy after Frege and Russell had banished it, and you can see Sandra Che's award-winning book on this if you want bloody details, but I'm very much in agreement with Sanford's way of telling the story. Now, of course, Wittgenstein came to think that the Tractatus turned out to be perhaps unwittingly dogmatic. He claimed to have resolved all the questions of philosophy, but the treatment of logic wasn't complete. And he came to see that the unity of truth is not purely formal in the way the Tractatus supposes. Later, Wittgenstein surrendered the ideal of a gap-free formal unity to logic. And he did that, I think, in response to Gödel's and Turing's logical work. 
And he adopted a more fluid ideal of simplicity. And I would argue that he makes the transition finally in 1937. So he came closer to handling the nature of truth exactly, it seems to me, in his later philosophy. But he had to alter our conception of exactitude and the role of formal constructions of truth. So after 1937, he thinks that the unity of truth is cobbled together through harmonies among us as we embed words and forms of life. It's very important to me that the notion of form of life only enters in 1937 after he reads Turing and the notion of kultur is eliminated from the manuscript in 1937 and the notion of technique enters for the first time Wittgenstein's manuscript in 1937. So this isn't a lecture on later Wittgenstein but that's the story that I see. What's important for us today is that the framing ideas of the MRT remained an inspiration to Wittgenstein throughout his life. And they also remained a constant inspiration for Gödel. He studied the multiple relation theory and the Tractatus response to it as an undergraduate, as a graduate student on the way to completeness and incompleteness, as a privat docent, and later on, we see him constantly checking out Russell's books from the library in Vienna while he's a student, and he begins his notebook, the Maxfield Notebook, the very day he accepts the invitation to write his paper on Russell's mathematical logic. And he begins with an allusion to the multiple relation theory. So he grew up with it and it was very important for him, not only for Wittgenstein. Now Frege and Wittgenstein is an important topic. Uh, Frege influenced Wittgenstein as much as Russell did throughout Wittgenstein's life. And I'm not going to deny the idea of the multi-decompositionality of a thought, which as a unity was very important to Wittgenstein, how important it was to Russell is highly disputed. Frege's context principle, very important. And also Frege emphasizes the idea that each thought has an opposite. To deny a thought is to affirm its opposite and to affirm a thought is to deny its opposite. This is very Tractarian as well. However, both uh, Vic, but Wittgenstein and Gödel rejected Frege's conception of a sentence as a name of a truth value, as well as Russell's idea that statements indicate or in some sense correspond to complexes. For Wittgenstein, sentences have a zin, but are sharply distinguished from names which have a bedoito. And Hanyo and Jose have explained that very well today. And by the way, that remains in Wittgenstein's later philosophy too. He never associates bedeutung with, with a sentence or a zatz. Now Gödel in 1944 in his paper on Russell agrees. He rigorizes a version of the slingshot argument, which is this argument that gives a reductio of Frege's idea that all true sentences designate the same value. As to sense, Gödel writes, one should expect to be in Russell's theory a possible fact, or rather the possibility of a fact which would exist also in the case of a false proposition, but Russell could never believe that such curious shadowy things really exist. So as Gödel knew, the Tractatus draws in such a modalized notion of negative fact. And Paul Horowitz raised the issue explicitly in response to Hanya today. What is this notion of a negative fact? Well, my answer would be that we can't just say that it's a fact like any other, what Wittgenstein is doing is in a way a gambit with Russell. He's offering to Russell the notion of a negative fact and showing or displaying that that notion doesn't have the sting, the metaphysical sting that Russell thought it did. So that's how I would read 2.06. So the MRT, I think I'll have to go quickly through this. Um, in 1906 to seven, Russell eliminated propositions as entities to avoid paradoxes, as well as the problem of false objectives or negative facts. So there are paradoxes talking about all propositions with a proposition. And the idea is to make the theory of descriptions help him turn talk about propositions into a mere façon de parler. Nevertheless, Russell needs something to play the role of propositions because he wants to say something about true as opposed to false judgments. That is, he wants to say something about what's common to all true judgments, what's common to all false ones, and characterize this primordial distinction between truth and falsity. So 
the theory is first framed in 1906 to seven. Judgment facts exist and are necessary for the concept of truth. And he's going to construe true belief as Jose and Hanyo have explained in greater than dyadic relational terms as a multi-grade relation among multiple objects. Now, according to the multiple relation theory, there's no dual relation between a judger and a proposition that she judges truly or falsely. There exists only a complex judgment fact or belief, which by the way, includes the judger, and it is neither true, it is either true or false. So true judgment facts correspond directly to extant facts. False fa judgment facts do not. So what's important is that this is not a representational theory. Here I agree with what Jan said about Bilden in German. It's not a representation. There's no vehicle of truth like a sentence. There are no negative facts and that's what the multiple relation theory is designed to accomplish. Well, here's Othello making the judgment, the, the tragic judgment that Desdemona who's talking to Cassio over here is in love with him. Uh, I think we won't need to picture that. Here's my picture of the multiple relation theory. I'm, I'm going to go through this very quickly, but it is a puzzling theory of truth and a distinctive one. In every judgment, there's only one and one only genuine relation that relates object. That's the belief itself. The mind somehow synthesizes the objects and relations of the judgment, okay, it, and it, 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 the ones that it's about. So it synthesizes them into a complex, but the complex that makes it what it is, is the belief itself. So it contains what it's about. While the mind synthesizes, according to Russell, it does not unite these elements, Desdemona, Cassio, loving, logical form, permutable elements. It doesn't unite them into a fact. The belief itself is a fact, but not a representation of one. And the so-called subordinate relation within the belief, loving, for example, does not in being somehow synthesized actually relate the objects in being configured in the belief. Now Schlick mentions Russell's theory in his general theory of knowledge. And what he says is it's an ingenious theory in which truth is built up entirely out of differences that characterize various kinds of relations. But Schlick's view is simpler, he argues, because his view, Schlick's view, by contrast, rests solely, he says, on the relation of pure coordination or correspondence, which is the simplest and most general of all relations. So Schlick himself contrasts the multiple relation theory with his correspondence view. But I don't think Schlick is really facing Russell's problem of truth head on, or anyway, not in Russell's view. And the Tractatus somewhat alludes to something similar at 6.363. Whereas Russell's multiple relation view arises from particular judgments and is metaphysical. In other words, you have to get to the distinction between truth and falsity through the table and the book. You, you can't get through it through some larger theory, which then takes in data and corrects itself as you go. You have to get it right at the first point. Schlick, however, begins with general laws and concept clusters and interprets language or theory in light of experience. And naturally this tips toward conventionalism, say about geometry in physics and or pragmatism. For Schlick, true sentences have designata, false sentences have none, but he really doesn't have an account of what's common to all true or all false judgments. He has a pure notion of correspondence, but in a sense it's empty as he himself would agree. So Russell uses the multiple relation view to provide a precise way of formally constructing truth bottom up. It's not top down or top versus bottom in pragmatic interaction, which is what the more Vienna Schlick view involves. The idea of course is to contain dogmatism, but be precise. We start at the beginning, at whether there's a table in front of us, at whether someone actually broke into the White House. If we can't get agreement there, then the problem of truth cannot be solved. So I think it's this basic approach that both Wittgenstein and Gödel throughout their lives devoted themselves to. And it certainly sets itself against conventionalism. 
And I would argue that J.L. Austin's writings on truth also imbibe something of the same spirit. Okay, so I'm gonna skip all this stuff um, on the multiple relation theory in Principia, but here's a remark from Gödel's Maxfield Notebook. Philosophical remark. Russell claims the proposition A believes BRC does not have the structure A believes BRC, but instead BRAC. What, however, is added or supervenes here in relation to all simple elementary propositions appears to be, says Gödel, not a new form, but a new content. So again, he's agreeing that forms are not things. All propositions revert to the same form, that is belief, but with another indication. Okay, so that's just to prove to you that Gödel really had thought about this, and he begins writing his essay in Russell's honor by going back to this problem. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so in Principia, Russell presents the ambiguity of truth in the introduction to Principia through a kind of bottom-up process. And the multiple relation theory he uses to characterize the quantifier free, uh, you might say elementary propositions from which the hierarchy will be constructed. And it's informal, it's not formalized, but it is a kind of quasi recursive presentation of what we would call semantics or truth conditions later on. So it inspires Wittgenstein, obviously. We're gonna construct propositions step-by-step step from this well-founded basis of elementary propositions. It's not dogmatic because first we straighten out the elementary level and then everything else is a formal construction bottom up from that. Gödel once was equally influenced by these passages on the way to his incompleteness theorem. First, it's pretty clear that he got his idea that truth is undefinable independently of Tarski from Russell's presentation of the Richard paradox in Principia, and then he diagonalizes out. And later on, in addition to reading Russell on truth the whole time, Gödel uses Russell's axiom of reducibility from the Principia in iterating this process of reflection to inspire his proof of the consistency of the continuum hypothesis. So again, for Gödel, this multiple relation theory approach is really important, but he follows the Tractatus in thinking you have to modalize what's going on. You've got to bring in some notion of possibility or possible structure to make this theory of truth work. Okay, I'm gonna skip Principia. This we could have fun with, but no, 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 it's too, we don't have time. However, note that uh, Russell does say, we may define truth, that's his italics, where such judgments are concerned as consisting in the fact that there's a complex corresponding to the discursive thought, which is the judgment. That is when we judge that A has the relation R to B, our judgment is said to be true when there is a complex. And it's said to be false when this is not the case. This is, he reiterates, this is a definition of truth and falsehood in relation to judgments of this kind. So when we have a judgment of perception for Russell, it's a dual relation. Why? Because perception is a success verb. If you're perceiving the cup on the table, then the cup is on the table or you can't be perceiving it. So perception is a dual relation, but not truth, as he says here. So that's the way the, pr the presentation is made in Principia. All right, now Wittgenstein told Russell in 1913 that he tried out this view and he found it wouldn't work. And there's an enormous literature of which you've seen two exemplary <laughs> presentations of ideas about today in the earlier talks about what exactly the multiple relation theory is, what exactly Wittgenstein's criticisms of it were, whether and how they led to Russell's abandoning his manuscript in 1913. So I'm not gonna take a stand on any of that really today. I think the criticisms could be organized in this way. There's the problem of order. How does a belief differentiate Desdemona loving Cassio from Cassio loving Desdemona? There's the problem of nonsense. This table pen holders this book. How is it that the constituents fit together? And negation and denying. 
If the items connected in the belief do not correspond to a fact, then the negated belief is true. But what's the logical connection between the negation and its opposite? Why does the law of excluded middle apply universally? Why is every belief true or false? Every particular belief is either true or false, according to Russell, but Russell doesn't explain this or anything about the logical interconnections among judgments of perception, these particular judgments. And here's Russell. Every theory of error sooner or later wrecks itself by assuming the existence of the non-existent. Whereas when I say Desdemona loves Cassio, it seems as if you have a non-existent love between Desdemonia and Cassio, but that's just as wrong as a non-existent unicorn. So you have to explain the whole theory of judgment in some other way. Again, he writes, suppose you try to make such a map as, as this. Here's like a, a kind of multiple relation picture of Othello believing that Desdemona loves Cassio. You cannot get in space any occurrence, which is logically of the same form as belief. When I say logically of the same form, I mean that one can be obtained from the other by replacing the constituents of the one by the new terms. If I say Desdemona loves Cassio, that's of the same form as A is to the right of B. Those are of the same form, and I say that nothing that occurs in space is of the same form as belief. I have got on here to a new sort of thing, a new beast for our zoo, not another member of our former species, but a new species, and the discovery of this fact is due to Mr. Wittgenstein. Now, this is very complicated because Gödel's favorite quote from Russell was that logic is the zoology of reality. But of course, we know that the Tractatus does not think that that's the purpose of logic. Logic is an activity. Logic is not like zoology. So there's a straightforward, you might say, missing of the minds between Russell and Wittgenstein in this passage. Nevertheless, in a way, I think that Russell sort of got something out of Wittgenstein that was important when he drew that picture. What's missing from that 2D spatial picture of belief are further dimensions or aspects of judgment. So Russell seems to have gotten something out of Wittgenstein, but not all the way through. And the point is that the Tractatus draws in the modalized idea of possibility and the idea of a vehicle of representation to support a more multidimensional view of truth. Multidimensionality meaning that there are different dimensions of generalization possible from a particular thought, and we follow those out and they have more dynamic interrelations. So the configurations of aspects of things mirrored or pictured in a sentence displays a possible ways things could be, a truth condition, and we either affirm or deny the picture. Every picture has a negation. So the negative facts as a façon de parler are formal, they are possibilities in logical space. And it's very important, the distinction between reality and the world. The world is everything that is the case. I totally agree with Jose about that. But it's not that the notion of reality is built up from that, so to speak, because Wittgenstein's an actualist. Rather, Wittgenstein is saying to do logic You've got to get past your assertions about what is the case and be able to see your assertions as possibly true or possibly false. And so you have to see your activities of picturing as realizing one possibility among many and in fact depicting possible things that are true, possibly true or possibly false. Otherwise you can't think your way through into what logic is. So we use sentences or models or pictures to represent or model what is the case, rightly or wrongly. Sentences or propositions are structures consisting of configurations of names. They don't function as names, but they depict articulately. But what's most important for Wittgenstein is that we're capable of seeing through our actual judgments about what's true and false to seeing each as an affirmation that one possibility among others is realized. We see ourselves taking a stand. So it's important that the same picture may be used to say what is the case or what is not the case. So there is an internal or necessary connection between P and not B. And the ways in which the elements are configured displays the form of a particular fact 
its possibility, as Jose, I think, explained also very well. Russell had banished modality. The subject of modality ought to be banished from logic since propositions are simply true or false, and there is no such comparative and supportive of truth as is implied by the notions of contingency and necessity. So I really think the problem Russell had in two-dimensional space was that he wasn't drawing in the idea of modality. Now here we have what we've, uh, many questions today for Hanyo and uh, Jose have been about 5.542. And I believe I have a slightly different way of reading this from the other two people. So I will, uh, I think I fall into the camp of people like Jose said, who don't believe that mental acts are part of the picture here at all. So Wittgenstein says it's clear, by the way, it is not clear when he says it's clear, he's simply wrong. It's clear that A believes P, A thinks P, A says P, or of the form P says P. And here we, and so on. Now by P in quotes, we don't mean a, a disquotation of a sentence. I think what we mean is an allusion to a situation in the world. A person, for example, standing in front of a tree, looking at the tree, making various behavioral movements and so on and so forth. That's what P in quotes is. And what happens when I attribute a belief to that subject, so to speak, is not that I attribute something that bears a relation to that subject. And it's not that I'm analyzing, so to speak, the relationship between the mental state of the thinker and the facts in the world, quite the opposite. I think that it's much more like Quine here. What I do is I take that situation to be a picture, a realization of a picturing of what is the case. And then I, in my language, having taken up those signs into my language, it's all pictorial all the way down. I either affirm or deny the belief, so to speak, that I ascribe to the other person. But it's not a theory of the language of thought in the sense of an account of mentality. And it's not an account of intentionality that has mental states, so to speak, in there. What's important is it's all pictorial. And then I have to take what you do up into my language and pictorially represent and then affirm or deny that it's the case. And built into this is of course the idea that the other person in their language, okay, could potentially agree or disagree with me. Okay, so that's why he says a composite soul is not a soul. You're analyzing the soul away. And I would also just say that the, the neutral monism of William James was known to Wittgenstein it was endorsed by Harry Sheffer, uh, who was a student of James, when he went to visit with Russell in 1910. And Russell resisted for a long time, but finally in analysis of, of mind and matter, he adopts neutral monism. And neutral monism, of course, is the idea that the soul vanishes, so to speak, under analysis from the material point of view. All right, now I have a couple more minutes. I think I have like maybe eight minutes or something, Nicoletta. Okay, good. I just wanna to get to Gödel quickly. I realize this is juggling many things in the air, but we've have, I have a very good platform to build on with the first two talks, so. Okay, so here's Gödel with Russell. Schlick keeps teaching Russell in all these seminars that Gödel goes to. And as I've mentioned, Amazingly enough, in Vienna, they have copies of all the library slips uh, that, you know, Gödel checks out. And we even have records of, of what Gödel annotated down in his notebooks when he checked out problems of philosophy for the third time. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, and he's obsessed with Russell's theory of truth. Uh, and what happened is Gödel purchased a copy of Principia in the summer of 1928, and that's what got him interested in going on in logic. But he was already well aware of how to read the opening of Principia with those judgments of perception because he'd already read philosophy of logical atomism and so on. So Gödel did appreciate that the multiple relation view is an alternative to what he was hearing from Schlick in Vienna. It's not a top-down view. This I think justifies what Hanyo was saying about how this is not an account in terms of truth makers or anything like that. That's not what's going on in the Tractatus. And I think Gödel appreciated that as well. 
What he tried to do was to develop an alternative account of the foundations of mathematics in terms of Russell's view. Now, Gödel on Wittgenstein, unfortunately, remained stuck, so to speak, in the parts of conventionalism that the middle Wittgenstein was well known for in the context of the Vienna Circle. So, and he didn't like the effect that the Tractatus had on Russell and philosophy of math. Russell goes on to say that mathematics is total logical. This is not what the Tractatus holds. It's not something Wittgenstein ever said, but it's what Russell got out of reading the Tractatus. So that irritated Gödel, we know. Um, moreover, Wittgenstein and Gödel both regarded mathematics through the eyes of Principia's predicative structuring of definitions. And they both always advocated the importance of the non-extensional, I'll say non-extensional rather than intentional because intentional makes it sound as though you believe in intentions, which I don't think Wittgenstein did. But anyway, you might think that there's a strong distinction between the extensional perspective and the non-extensional perspective. And this was Wittgenstein's view. And my book with Felix Mulholzer just makes that out. And by the way, we don't think Wittgenstein is a finitist about the real numbers, but he does insist on a sharp distinction between the non-extensional and the extensional point of view. And he thinks that it's wrong to think that the extensional point of view trumps or somehow destroys the non-extensional point of view. Instead for Wittgenstein, we simply have two aspects, you might say, of the real numbers and we have to live with that tension, right? So that's how we're gonna read this. So Wittgenstein sharply separated non-extensionalism from extensionalism, whereas Gödel hoped to combine them in developing a concept theory of the infinite. Now, what about the infinite? Russell tended to consider finite cases when he discusses the multiple relation theory, like Desdemona and Cassio, because he was interested in the theory of symbolism, which of course is finite. Presumably these sentences are finite. But Russell was always careful to allow that reality and perceptual experience may be infinitely complex. And Gödel would have noticed this reading the lectures on logical atomism. Russell is explicit against the uh, Wiener Kreis, particularly in his 1940 William James lectures, again, William James, the inquiry into meaning and truth, Russell is attacking the Vienna Circle's anti-metaphysical attitude. Okay, so Gödel is on Russell's side all the way. Now, according to Russell's theory, aspects or features of facts are peeled off through perception and then arranged in a configuration, which may or may not correspond to an existing complex. Why not simply say that all perception is actually organized as Gestalt theorists claim? Why not simply take order in reality or possible order as basic to the multiple relation view and Wittgenstein and Gödel do. So by the way, did Suzanne Langer in her readings of these things, but Russell of course never did. And he's explicit in the William James lectures, he attacks this. Okay, I'm just gonna go through that really quickly. Okay, so I've got to end. So the bottom line here is that I think Gödel is advocating an infinitary version of the multiple relation theory. On this view, perception would be actually infinite at the outset, but as in the Tractatus, only the possibility of order would be given. Axioms codify possible order. And so Gödel reverts to Leibniz because he needs to have a concept theory and axioms and proof are to control that theory. Now, thanks to Turing, the notion of a step in a formal system is absolute. It doesn't depend upon which axioms, how strong the axioms are that you take up. That's the point about computability. What's computable is absolute in that sense. It never changes when you change your formalism. So a proof is controllable, step-by-step -step procedures are controllable, but not in the same way the infinite. And here's the opening of Max Phil. It seems very cryptic, but if you've heard what I've said, you'll see how I would read Gödel's rather cryptic diary note. Nominalistic systems, perhaps fruitful if provable instead of true, then to contain analysis. From the possibility of negative being follows that the being of relation is a potentiality to the external world. What do these two little pieces teach us, he asks. And if you know about the multiple relation theory, you probably understand something. My suggestion would be, 
The first contains proof and the second contains truth, concerns truth. So after 1950, Gödel pictured his opposition to Wittgenstein in terms of his opposition to conventionalism, verificationism, relativism. And most often, Gödel identified himself with Platonism and after 1950, phenomenology. Later, Wittgenstein Gödel thought seemed not to understand his theorems. However, there's a much more subtle interplay between them centering around Russian Russell's vision for the fundamental philosophical problem. Wittgenstein holds early and late that perception possesses the possibility of structuring in language and logic possesses the formality, the possibility of step-by-step -step calculative procedures. Gödel reworks and generalizes this. The mathematician requires perception and analysis thereof, axioms control proof, but truth is extraction of aspects from potentially infinite or perhaps actually infinite perceptions. And so Gödel's Platonism is really a dialectical Platonism, the Platonism of the real Platonic dialogues where the notion of forms is dialectically argued with. At least that would be my reading of what's going on. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much. That was 40 minutes, like. <laughs> oh, good, okay, I didn't exactly. have a lot of time. I knew you would tell me, Nicoletta, if I went over. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. That's why I, I um, okay. So now